All right, now in the area of wedding ceremonies and traditions, just a couple of questions around that. You know, and I think with wedding ceremonies and traditions, it's really an area of doubt, what the Bible calls doubtful disputations. Like a doubtful disputation is where the Bible has not clearly said it's right and the Bible has not clearly said it's wrong. It's, a, it's an area of preference and opinion. Uh, 1 Corinthians 10 says here in verse 29, you know, conscience I say, not of thine own, but of the other. But Paul says here, why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? So we have a conscience, we have you know, preferences and convictions that we apply to ourselves. But Paul is saying here, you know, he does things out of love for another person, but he should not be condemned or judged by a preference or conviction of somebody else. Why is my liberty, my freedom judged of another man's conscience? So there's a couple of principles we just want to apply here uh, in the area of doubtful disputations. And I'll just turn to them really quick. Uh, Bible says here in Romans 14, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. And here's the principle, for whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So I think we have a principle here that if you don't believe what you're doing is right, it is sin for you. So if you're doing something and you're doubting, you're not sure whether this is the right thing to do, if you then go and do it, it's a sin. And then we see here in uh, James 4 verse 17, Therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. So on the flip side, so we know that if you think something is wrong to do and you do it, it's a sin. If you think something is right to do and you don't do it, it's a sin to you. So we have these principles here to help us judge things that are, of, uh, you know, that are doubtful disputations. So let's uh, think about some scenarios. So some people will say, well, in order to legitimize a marriage, you need a minister to marry you. Do I believe that? Well, based on what we know about marriage and what marriage is, it's a covenant between two people. You know, other witnesses are not required. It's a witness that God witnesses. It's a, it's a covenant that God witnesses, and that's what legitimizes it. So does a minister need to perform your marriage? Well, no. You know, does that mean I'm not going to perform your marriage? No, I will, because if you guys want one, then I'll, I'll, you know, we'll do it. There's nothing wrong with a minister performing a marriage, but is it required? If, let's say if somebody said, you know, I don't want to have the ceremony, I don't want to have all these things, are they not in a legitimate marriage? No, because that's not what legitimizes a marriage. I think it's more the formalities of the ceremony and traditions in our culture that it has been done that way. And to be honest, I think maybe it comes down from you know, traditions that have been held from, I don't know, maybe the Protestant church or the Catholic church where somebody needs, you, know, you need somebody in, in ministerial authority to legitimize this, this union. And because our government is based on these Christian principles, they probably do the same where they require you know, a government official to legitimize your marriage and they want to be able to control who is married and who isn't uh, for legal reasons. <clears throat> so, um, I don't think a minister is necessarily re required to perform the ceremony in order to legitimize a marriage. And you know, I, I just think ceremonies in general, you know, just, you know, just ceremonies, different types of, you know, all different cultures have different ways of do, you know, performing the marriage vows and having that ceremony. But I think ceremonies in general are just, just man-made because you don't really see any sort of ceremony in the Bible, do you? When you read the Bible, you don't read anything about how the marriage ceremony takes place. When you look at marriage in the Bible, and we'll just look at a couple of these verses, the marriage is not actually the ceremony as we would, we would think of it. It's more what we would call the reception. That's what the mar marriage is. Um, if we see here in Matthew 22, this is the parable of the king that prepared a marriage for his, his son. He says, The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding, and they were not come. So you know in our vernacular we say the wedding is the ceremony, and then we have the reception afterwards. Whereas in the Bible, it's almost like they're one and the, one and the same thing, that there's really just this celebration, what we would call the ceremony, to celebrate the fact that these two people have come together. And they were not come, and you know, he calls his servants, he says, tell them which are bidden, behold I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready come unto the marriage. Uh, look here in John 2. Huh. 
You know, he says here on the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus was there. So this is the, the, the story of Jesus going to that marriage in Cana of Galilee. And look, it says here in verse 9, when the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom and saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. So when Jesus went to this marriage in Cana of Galilee, it, we don't hear anything about the ceremonial side of the marriage. We only see the feast and the celebration and the eating. And even uh, the marriage of Jesus Christ and his bride in Revelation. I'll just show you this verse here. Revelation 19. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honour to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So I just think ceremonies in general are man-made, so there isn't really a right way or a wrong way to do them, unless you are doing you know, pagan practices. But even some practices that are supposedly pagan are not pagan in and of themselves. So if somebody doesn't believe they're wrong to do, then they're not necessarily wrong to do. I can't really think of any other example. You know, some examples might be you know, lighting a candle, you know, in you know, the unity candle. I don't know if there is, is some sort of pagan origin behind it, but candles in and of themselves are not pagan. So if two people want to light candles to symbolize unity, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's up to them. This is a doubtful disputation. If they don't believe it's wrong to do, then it's not wrong to do because candles in and of themselves are not sinful. God did not give us guidelines of what to do with our wedding ceremony. I think he gives us the liberty to celebrate as we would, just like holidays and things like that. So, you know, where should you get married? You know, a lot of people say, oh, I want to get married in a church. I don't want to just get married in any building. But remember, you know, church is not a building. So you, it doesn't matter what building you get married in. You know, there's nothing, you're not getting married in a church just because you're getting married in a fancy looking building with a crucifix on it. That's not being uh, married in a church because uh, church is the people. It doesn't uh, legitimize your marriage either way or the other. You know, some people will say, well, you shouldn't get married in a Catholic building. Or an Anglican building. Well, it doesn't matter because it's not like you're getting married in a Catholic church. Because remember, the church is the people; it's not the building. I mean, you want to rent a building that looks like a Catholic church, uh, looks like that is a Catholic building. There's nothing wrong with that because you're just renting a building. It's no different as if you're renting, um, uh, you know, just a, a, an open space somewhere else. It, it's not a sin to do. So, um, it's not wrong to get married in a building that is normally used by a Catholic church because sometimes those buildings are the best to, to, to do it in because they've already got the pews set up and, and all that sort of stuff. Another thing is, you know, a wedding isn't a church gathering. So I don't, I don't believe a wedding is a type of church gathering. I mean, number one, because the purpose of that gathering is not Jesus Christ. You know, the purpose of that gathering is for two people to, to be married. So it's, I, I wouldn't treat it as a uh, church gathering. So I don't actually have, I don't believe I have authority in that gathering. So, you know, I, I don't think, um, you know, bishops should dictate how people are to get married because it's, I don't believe it's a church uh, gathering and they don't have any authority in that aspect. So, you know, the purpose, number one, is, is to celebrate the marriage. It's not for Jesus Christ. And at number two, it's not church because it's a gathering of believers and unbelievers, isn't it? It's not just a gathering of believers. And, you know, you say, but, oh, you know, the purpose is still to glorify God, but then everything we do should glorify God. So that doesn't mean any time we gather with just everybody, it's always church. Um, we should always glorify God. So what are some other, what are some practical um, aspects of marriage, of, of, the, of the wedding ceremony that may, be, may not be either right or wrong and it's just a matter of preference? Well, you know, in Asian culture you have a, diff a different ceremony. You know, we, we are used to the walking down the aisle and the father handing off the bride and having the rings and all that sort of stuff and then the signing and whatnot. That's what we practice in, I guess, the Western civilization and probably comes from 
you know, how, how churches did it in the past. But you guys may know, but in Asian culture, you don't have that sort of ceremony. They don't have the walk down the aisle and the bridesmaid and the groomsmen and the bouquet and all that sort of stuff. They have what's called a tea ceremony. And the younger people will serve tea to the older people. And then once they've served tea to all the older people, then they flip and then, you know, they're sitting there and then all the younger people serve tea. And the symbolism there is that the family is accepting this, this marriage. And then once all the family has accepted it, they now sit there as husband and wife and the younger siblings serve them tea. Now there's nothing wrong if somebody wants to get married that way. If somebody would rather have a tea ceremony, then, um, then have the walk down the aisle, bridesmaid, groomsmen, dress up sort of wedding. But, you know, I think there are some things that are wrong about it. So, for example, you know, in a tea ceremony, sometimes people will practice it where they will get on their knees and they will bow before their ancestors to serve them tea. You know, I think that's wrong because the Bible does say you, you, we should not bow before other people. We shouldn't bow before men. We shouldn't bow before idols. So it, should, it is wrong to bow before your ancestors because that practice comes from ancestral worship. So we can see there that there are traditions different ways people celebrate marriage and there are wrong things about them but serving tea is not wrong so if somebody wants to do that you know I've I've had friends that have had their tea ceremony to respect their parents but they did it standing instead of kneeling so there's a way that you could have your tea ceremony um, and do your wedding that way but still do it in a way that is pleasing to God and not sinful Now in Revelation 19, we see here that, you know, to her, in verse 8, to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So number one, the white dress in a wedding doesn't represent purity, as, as a lot of people think. It represents her, her virginity and things like that. The white linen in the Bible actually represents the righteousness of the saints, because the marriage between a man and a woman is likened to the relationship between Jesus Christ and the people of God, or in this case, the, the city, which, which, which is debatable what, what the bride of, bride of uh, Jesus Christ is. But my point here is, you know, she's arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. Now, does this mean that you need to have a white dress for your wedding? No, because just because Jesus Christ's bride here is likened to having a, a, a linen, clean and white, uh, doesn't mean that we're commanded to have a white dress. Because this is not a commandment to have a white dress for your wedding. It's just saying this is what the bride of Christ was wearing. Now, I would say that it's my opinion. You know, I, I think if I see something in the Bible and I see an example in the Bible, I would probably follow it. So to me, you know, it's a good idea that you have a white dress to symbolize things that we do see in the Bible. Because if the bride of Christ is arrayed in white linen, I would want my bride arrayed in white linen for my wedding. But... You know, I admit that that's a preference of mine. So if somebody wants to wear a blue dress, if somebody wants to wear a red dress, pink dress, you know, it, it, it doesn't really matter. It's not um, a, a right or wrong answer. You know, it's like, it's like whether or not you want to have a wedding where you're all dressed up. You know, you can say, well, you, you know, she's arrayed in fine linen. You, you know, you're adorned for your husband. You know, we see in Matthew 22, the parable where the guest came and didn't have on a wedding garment. So we see the, the, the examples here that, oh, you know, maybe we sh should dress up and, and a wedding is something where you wear different clothing. But because these are not commandments, these are just examples we see in the Bible, it's not something where we can say you must have that type of wedding and it's a sin if you don't have that type of wedding. So, you know, because, you, you know, I'm sure you've gone to weddings where there might be a theme there and they might want to have some fun with their wedding. Maybe it's a more casually dressed wedding. I don't believe that is necessarily wrong in and of itself, but I do think we have examples in the Bible that we can follow where a wedding is something where we should dress up. Uh, in my opinion, we should dress up. You know, the, the bride should be adorned for her husband and, and, and beauty up a bit just for that special day. So dress up a wedding garment. Um, all right, what about wedding rings? Wedding rings, should, should, should we have wedding rings? I mean, I've got on a wedding ring. But to be honest, I think a wedding ring is a tradition. It, it is not a commandment. If people get married and they don't want to have wedding rings, you know, that's fine. That's the, it's, a, it's another preference. So I think we have, I, the reason why I decided to have a wedding ring, to be honest, I don't, I don't know why. I think I was just following tradition. I just think I felt weird not having a wedding ring. I, want, I, I wanted other people to know I was married. So I, don't, I didn't want 
culture to think, well, you know, you're married, but you're not wearing a wedding ring. Are you trying to hide the fact that you're married? So I think it was more that that led to my decision. You know what, we'll just get wedding rings just so people know that we're married. But if you don't have wedding rings, it doesn't mean you're not married. It doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong because wedding rings are not actually in the Bible. And in fact, when you look up the way rings are used in the Bible, it's more a symbol of power than it is a symbol of, of marriage. Now, what do I think about engagement rings? Now, I personally, think, I personally think engagement rings are a waste of money. And I think if you, and this is obviously a preference of mine, I, the reason why I think diamonds and engagement rings are a waste of money is because they're way overpriced. You know, the only reason why, I mean, if you look up diamonds on the internet and why they cost so much, it's because it's a controlled market. I mean, it's a useless rock that, that I think is, has been scammed up, uh, upon the female population to think that they're valuable when they're not. Because the only thing driving up a diamond's value is the lust of women. Because they don't, they don't have any industrial value or anything. Once you cut that diamond in that shape, you can't use it for anything else. You can't like melt it down. Like once you melt it down and it's not cut that way, it's worth nothing. So the reason why I think engagement rings are, are you know, especially diamond engagement rings, I feel like they're just a waste of money because that, that $5,000 or $10,000 that you spent on that engagement ring could, could go into your house, could go into something else that was, is useful to, to both your husband and wife. And, and, I, and I just know um, by the nature of diamonds that, that it's a scam. Like that it, to, to, to charge people that much for a diamond is really just a marketing ploy. And it's just perpetuated by women wanting them. Because if women didn't want diamonds, they wouldn't cost that much because they're useless. Um, besides for, for, for value in terms of, you know, uh, for jewelry. So... You know, are wedding rings biblical? No, they're not biblical. I think it's a tradition. You know, are they pagan? No, they're not pagan because just because they're in a circle shape, you know, s pagans don't own, own the shape circle. But I do think that wedding rings don't, they don't symbolize what people think they do. Because people will say, oh, you know, it's a, it's a circle and it, and it symbolizes your, your eternal love for each other. But that's wrong because your love is not eternal, right? Your love is only your, your covenant is only until death so it's not even a, a symbol of your love it, it's it's purely just a, i guess a symbol to other people to show that you that you are married <clears throat> so maybe instead of an engagement ring you know you should pay maybe a dowry to the father or something that's a bit more biblical but why do religious weddings usually follow a certain pattern? I think the reason why they follow a certain pattern is because of legal reasons. Because one thing I didn't realize about uh, you know, legal weddings and uh, re you know, creating a religious denomination is part of that process. If you want to create a religious denomination so that you can perform weddings for the government, you have to put in an order of service. And this is why you know, you know, Gershon and Christine, they're gonna, we're gonna have an Anglican minister help us for this wedding but we have to have an order of service that's very similar to an Anglican wedding in order for them to sign it. And as long as there's nothing wrong in there, I don't mind doing that. But I think this is why, you know, different religions, you know, it's perpetuated that they have a certain ceremony because often it's written into law and the ministers that are appointed to do that wedding have to have, are, have an obligation to do it a certain way and that's why they are done the way they are. All right, let's change gears. <coughs> All right, what about a woman? <laughs> These two ladies are giggling here. All right, what about, what about a woman? Um, what about the question of taking your husband's name? Because some women take their husband's name, some women don't. I personally believe it's biblical to take your husband's name. Um, and my wife, even though we haven't changed it legally, she goes by my name. She goes by Elizabeth Tay, even though legally she's Elizabeth Ascanio Ramirez. But this is the reason why I think a woman should take a, a, a husband's name. Because look here in Genesis 5, it says, This is the book of the generations of Adam in the day that God created man. In the likeness of God crea uh, made he him. Male and female created he them. So again, we see that man is created in the likeness and image of God because man, God is a man and God cre created man to look like man. Uh, male and female created he them and blessed them, and look, and called their name Adam in the day when they were created. So he created man 
He created Eve, their wife, but he refers to both of them as Adam. And this is why I think women should take the name of the husband when they get married, because this is not only just man referring to husband and wife as Adam, this is actually how God refers to them. And I think that is a strong enough principle for me to have the opinion of, hey, I think um, a woman should take the uh, name of her husband. So I think there's a basis for this preference, um, but it's not necessarily a commandment. So I don't, I'm not going to condemn anyone and say that you're sinning by not doing it, but I do think there is a strong biblical precedent to do that since it is God recognizing um, the man and his wife as Adam and not Eve. You know, I think it's also symbolic because it's symbolic of the woman you know, leaving her family and joining her husband's family. So they are identified as one family. I personally just feel that if a woman keeps her name, it's almost like she's trying to hold on to her family heritage. And not necessarily saying that that is what she's doing, but if that's what she's doing, then she's got the wrong attitude going into marriage. Because if you're trying to say, you know, I want to keep my family, I want to stay with my family, that's not what marriage is. Marriage is you leaving your family, joining your husband and creating a new family.